Hello and welcome to the third and final session of this year's technical expert meeting on mitigation, the 10M 2020, with its focus on human settlements, sustainable low emission housing and building solutions, technologies and design for buildings, housing and construction. My name is Marion Canute and I'm your moderator for the session today. As a broadcaster and a media and communications person, I've seen the importance of meetings like these cannot be overstated because they bring together such a diversity of participants around the communications watering hole, as it were. And that provides a fertile space for the sharing of valuable insights and information. For this session, our online gathering includes expert panelists and speakers as well as participants from around the world. A very warm welcome to you all. The organizers of this year's 10M are the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC Secretariat, and the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction, Global ABC. And just for your information, this session is being recorded. In session one, the topic was cool buildings for all. And last week's session was all about building back better and circular economy. Today, however, we pull back the lens to look at developing pathways for moving to scale, always with the target in mind of achieving zero emission buildings by 2050. We'll be hearing from a panel of four expert speakers who will share their insights on the challenges and solutions to moving sustainable buildings to scale. And we'll also invite you, our online audience, to make your voices heard via two interactive platforms. First, you can talk to our panelists during the Q&A part of this session by sending us your questions and comments via the Microsoft Teams chat panel. That's on the right-hand side of your screen. And feel free to direct your questions to a specific speaker or speakers. You can also participate in our online poll via a second platform called Mentimeter. Some of you may be familiar with it, where we will post some topical questions and ask you for your multiple choice answers. For that, please go to www.menti.com and use the code 6661718. We'll also share those results during the Q&A segment. As ever, I strongly urge you to participate because your input is valuable to the 10 m process and to this climate discussion, especially as the outcomes will inform important policy recommendations. And yes, your voice does make a difference. And now to set the stage for today's presentations and discussion, Martina Otto, head of the Cities Unit of the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, and the Global ABC Secretariat will talk about introducing tools for moving to scale. MPGCA, the acronym for Marrakesh Partnership for Global Climate Action, Pathways and Regional Roadmaps. But just before she takes center stage, a bit of background on our opening speaker. Martina Otto has over 20 years of experience in environmental policy and program management with a special focus on energy and transport. In her 16 years with UNEP or UN Environment, she has served in different functions out of Paris and Nairobi, and she now heads the organization's work on cities. Before joining UN Environment, Martina worked on trade and environment and economic instruments in the area of environmental protection with the UN Conference on Trade and Development, the European Commission, and the Foundation for International Environmental Law and Development. As a fully qualified lawyer specialized in environmental law, Martina also worked with a major US law firm on environmental due diligence in the context of mergers and acquisitions. Martina, it's wonderful to have you with us live for this session, and it's with great pleasure that I now hand over the virtual microphone to you. Thank you very much, uh, Marion, um, for this introduction and for setting us off uh, on today's session. I will try and uh, share my screen. Um, let me see whether that works. I hope it does. And uh, to get us started, uh, Tools for Moving to Scale, Regional Roadmaps and the MPGCA Pathways. 
why do we need uh, roadmaps and pathways? And if we go to the first slide, that does show you um, the, the first reason, and that's because the sector is responsible for almost 40% of energy and process related greenhouse gas emissions. And without decarbonizing buildings and construction, we will not be able to reach the Paris Agreement. And uh, actually, beyond that, the sector is not living up to its potential. So on the one side, we have these emissions, um, and that obviously shows the potential. And um, the fact is that we have a lot of solutions that are readily available. They're known, they're proven, and they're cost effective. But uh, the rate of improvement of energy efficiency See, not keeping up with the additional floor space that we're seeing. And that means that the sector is on a growth in emissions track rather than a reduction track. And that's why it's so critical to look at both operational emissions and what we call the embodied carbon, and which was very much the subject to the last round. Um, so the emissions linked to the material production and the construction process itself. And there's a third reason um, why these roadmaps and pathways are so important, and that's the nature of the sector, because it's very fragmented with a lot of players uh, along the uh, value chain that need to act in, in sync. And if we go to the next slide, um, it tells us as well uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has just underlined uh, the importance of future proofing this uh, sector as COVID-19 has led us to transform our, our apartments and uh, uh, well, our, our living spaces to schools and offices, at least temporarily. Um, and it has come on top of a housing crisis as well, uh, with those living in inadequate conditions shown to be more vulnerable. And uh, this would go just as much for climate-induced heat waves and floodings and so on, calling for more resilience measures and uh, better buildings for the sake of people's health and well-being. And uh, beyond these uh, environmental and, uh, and social um, elements, in the recovery of our economies at the moment, um, the sector will play a critical role. For example, green building renovation is known to create more jobs than many other sectors, um, with about nine to 30 jobs created for every million dollar invested and 60% of investments uh, in uh, energy efficiency going towards local labor. So it's also um, a key factor, factor here for, for rebuilding our economies. And that underlines the importance of the sector for sustainable development overall. And if you go to the next slide with us, thank you. Um, so this is uh, why we why we need these roadmaps uh, for taking the solutions to scale and now how we do this. Um, we need to overcome this fragmentation of the sector and spur radical collaboration. Um, we need to spark a common language and have a shared understanding of the issues. And we also need to have clear targets and milestones driving our actions. And this is why the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction embarked on a process to develop global um, and a set of regional roadmaps. And you see the covers of those here. They were developed in cooperation with the International Energy Agency and in a consultative process with over 700 stakeholders globally. They do uh, provide both a process and a framework to develop sub-regional and national roadmaps and strategies and they outline a range of actions that stakeholders can take in the short, medium and long term to achieve built environment that is zero emission, efficient and resilient. And if we go to the next slide, um, it shows, takes a little bit of lead time, I see. Um, uh, it shows as well the importance of these roadmaps to inform the nationally determined contributions. And, oops, no, it's the one before. Sorry. Um, there we have no the one before. Yes, this one. Um, and that shows actually uh, that's a snapshot uh, of buildings uh, reflected in NDCs. And uh, you have the explanation on the left hand side. But what we actually need to get at uh, to get it right is that this, these maps, all of these maps, need to turn to green and eventually to blue. And you see from the color coding at the moment, um, there's a lot to be to be done. And if we go to the next slide, 
the roadmaps do cover eight priority areas. And for each of these, uh, we propose key actions, targets for policies uh, and technologies, and enabling measures with the aspiration of reaching net zero carbon emission buildings by 2050. Um, I don't see the next slide yet. I don't know um, if I'm the only one. It has not yet appeared. We, we don't see it either. OK. There it is. OK, nope. Today we seem to be having troubles with the responsiveness of the system. It's a little sluggish, but yeah, because now we're three ahead. <laughs> Well, while it comes up, uh, the eight um, priority areas um, uh, that we that we have put forward. Uh, the first one is now here we go, urban urban planning. And uh, you can see we always look at the current status 2020 and the recommended actions. And for urban planning, it's really about prioritizing sustainable urban planning and development. Uh, we have split up new buildings and existing buildings um, for new buildings, a key uh, area of action uh, is to prioritize new building energy codes and standards. For existing buildings, um, it's the acceleration of action on building retrofits um, with um, low energy decarbonizing uh, strategies and uh, renovation rate increases, um, for example. Uh, and uh, for building operations, uh, we look at uh, the development of benchmarking and certification tools and setting performance standards for system energy efficiency savings and adopt monitoring and energy uh, management systems as as well. Uh, if we go to the next uh, slide, we see the next action area, which is around uh, appliances and systems. Um, and here it is about strengthening and expanding existing minimum energy performance requirements uh, to support uh, greater improvement in low cost uh, efficient cooling technologies and that links us back to the first session that we had uh, in cooling for all. Uh, another area is materials very importantly and I set us off with that uh, uh, highlighting the importance uh, of the embodied uh, carbon as well to be addressed and uh, here we need to look at uh, the adoption of low carbon materials uh, very much so. Uh, and there are different strategies available, and that links us to the second session that we had uh, in the TEMM. Then resilience, not to be forgotten. Uh, we need to build greater resilience uh, for buildings and communities, um, and that involves integrated risk assessment and resilience strategies, um, not least for the coastal urban um, centers uh, as, as well. And the last one, uh, but not least, is clean energy, um, and we need to look at the acceleration of access to clean energy um, and there obviously we look at uh, regulatory frameworks and the financial incentives um, as well as uh, procurement as a real lever to take us to greater action. Um, and as I said, uh, this, uh, these are the eight priority areas and we have every time um, a policy action that is recommended, a, a range of um, technology actions and every time with uh, targets for the short, medium and long term and you see how how that, that pans out uh, for one example, which is about uh, new buildings. And we've taken that example from the Asia roadmap. Um, but just to finish off on, on this, we always have a finance um, action list as well that shows financial tools, particularly relevant for each of the activities, followed by a series um, of local examples of current practice. And so uh, we also zoom in on capacity uh, building needs as well as an indication of the multiple benefits, again, linking us back to the uh, sustainable development goals. Now to this example of uh, actions for uh, new buildings um, in 2019. Um, so well, I mean, that's the data that we had, uh, obviously. So that's the status today. Um, only 44% uh, of countries in Central, Southeast and Southeast Asia had mandatory or voluntary building energy codes in, in place. Um, and uh, and we, we, we worked it out all the way to a long term goal 2050 where we say most new buildings operating uh, need to be operating at net zero carbon emissions. And then there is a whole series of of, uh, of actions um, between um, status quo and where we want to be. Uh, and I'll zoom in on um, 
a few of those uh, and uh, starting off with uh, developing local roadmaps. Uh, so we need to take this regional roadmap to the national level um, to develop locally appropriate strategies uh, for the decarbonization. Um, and we need to take a whole life cycle carbon assessment approach in, uh, in doing so. The second point is to develop and implement mandatory energy codes. Um, already highlighted how important those are for this transition that we need to see. And we need to actually, in some places, there is a voluntary one, but we need to actually get to mandatory codes. Um, so it's that transition that needs to be accompanied um, going forward. And we need to look at performance based building codes, not not restrictive in terms of concrete measures um, and concrete technologies, but really performance based to leave enough space for private sector response as well um, on on this. Uh, and obviously the codes should uh, should uh, set or refer to guidelines for locally adapted um, bioclimatic design principles and increase uh, uh, as well, the uh, climate resilience and uh, embodied uh, carbon materials. So it's not only the operational side in the end, which is highlighted under this, but we want to refer back to what we have um, on, on materials and, for example, as well on urban planning, as well as, um, as, uh, as the clean energy side. Uh, we also need to uh, look at uh, the improvements of building codes uh, so that there is a, a stepwise stepping up of the level of ambition with reviews of uh, well cycles of every three to five years, for example, um, to, to, to push the sector a bit further. Uh, another area to highlight is uh, the space uh, um, cooling. Uh, and uh, as we as we know, school, cooling is uh, a really fast growing um, end use energy end use um, sector in uh, with regard to buildings. And uh, we need to uh, prioritize uh, prioritize here as well the passive design uh, in order to maintain thermal comfort. Uh, so that's a key area. Governments leading by example and here public procurement is a key lever that has been emphasized in um, building the markets. Uh, we need to reduce embodied carbon. I think I, I spoke to that already quite a bit. Um, and it's about increasing awareness and information about the multiple benefits of more sustainable buildings, uh, but also how to how to uh, entice consumers actually to uh, to to go for those and uh, to look at more advantageous uh, financing as well. So this information is actually critical in doing so. If we go to the next slide. Um, that talks to a number of gaps that we have identified uh, in uh, our stakeholder consultations. Um, we have classified them into ambition gaps and data gaps, um, data gaps referring to where more information is, is needed. Uh, and uh, the first ambition gap that we that we have is this issue around the, the codes. Um, so the first is um, whether they're, if they are there, if they're not there, then they need to be built. The second step is from voluntary to mandatory, but then there is a compliance issue um, as, as well. They need to be enacted and not only be in existence. And so here we depend as well on um, local, local government action. A lot uh, of responsibility falls uh, to them. And um, uh, so there's there's a there, there, there's a there's an issue here uh, in how to actually really make sure that uh, that there are in enforced. Um, the second uh, is a data gap. Uh, that's the participation of the informal sector and uh, in buildings and construction. There's a huge uh, contribution um, that comes through informal uh, activities and. Uh, it's a major challenge to uh, include the uh, informal sector here, and there will be a need for more capacity building, um, accessible construction guidelines and tools, and a wider stakeholder engagement to increase um, the uh, compliance with codes also in the informal sector. Another area is the labeling um, of uh, building components. And here uh, it's, a, it's a data gap where we need more robust information on the performance of individual building components. Um, and that's key uh, for designers to optimize building design and perform life cycle 
uh, analysis um, over the whole uh, life performance of the building. LCA already mentioned that's a super critical one so that we don't only look at operational but really across the entire life cycle. And now an example um, on, on the technology side, looking at passive design. And here we have an um, uh, ambition gap uh, because uh, we heard from, from stakeholders as well um, that there is um, very little adoption of passive cooling strategies uh, at, uh, at the moment with a few examples of naturally or mixed mode ventilated buildings in tropical climates. And um, uh, there, there has been a bit of a question around that, uh, how likely it is uh, that uh, these approaches will be adopted indeed by 2040 um, or already. Uh, but it's something that we need to strive to. If you go to the next slide, um, what do these results mean for stakeholder groups? Um, and, and clearly, uh, there is this need for more performance-based building codes, that's one, uh, but it's also how can we make sure that uh, whatever comes out of these uh, roadmaps uh, is actually uh, well, feeding into the nationally determined contributions. And uh, I just want to highlight again, this uh, map that we showed uh, at, the, at the outset, where we uh, saw how important it is to, um, uh, to to get to the green and and blue, so meaning that uh, uh, all the buildings are actually covered uh, in in this. And so, uh, what we need to 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 look at here is really passive design to reduce the cooling demand, resilience, life cycle approach, and low carbon materials to be embedded much more visibly in this. If we go to the next slide. Um, we, we started off with saying it's a fragmented sector and it's actually really uh, a difficult one because there's so many people who need to, to, to work in, in parallel. And if you look at the design that already involves different professions and uh, we need to um, make sure uh, that in the design uh, phase, the uh, different ideas around efficiency, low carbon cost effective housing um, is already incorporated. And obviously that's driven again by, by building codes. If we go to the next slide. No, that's not coming up. Probably just takes a couple of seconds. Yeah. Well, the next slide is about um, the next steps. Uh, so where do we go from from here? And uh, uh, what we need to do is to spark more of a regional dialogue and collaboration, um, take uh, the regional actions to the national level. So to build those national strategies for decarbonization. Um, to help raise the level of ambition and to help support filling uh, the, the data gaps. So that's um, that's absolutely critical in this. And I'm coming to the last slide. Um, and that is uh, that our roadmaps um, also inform the race to zero human settlements pathway and uh, the climate action pathways do outline the longer term vision for a 1.5 degree climate resilient world and do set out actions needed to achieve that that future and it's done under the leadership of the high level champions, climate champions, um, and these documents are being developed by different coalitions and initiatives under the Marrakesh Partnership for Global Climate Action, and they do provide an overview of the transformational actions and milestones across the thematic and cross cutting areas of the partnership that are needed. And I really want to highlight um, the uh, message on the human settlements pathway and that's very clear we need to de decarbonize the built environment across the whole life cycle and we need a radical collaboration along the entire value chain of the buildings and construction sector and that actually does translate to um, ambitious uh, targets by 2020 uh, with all new buildings to operate at net zero carbon and um, to be resilient all new buildings, infrastructure and renovations to have at least 40% uh, less embodied carbon and uh, to, to really step up our renovation rates um, to increase significant, significantly to at least 3% uh, per year. So that's the idea. The timeline for this um, is that there is a draft that is ready. Um, 
uh, it's being it's being consulted uh, and finalized. Uh, the main messages uh, will be published at the beginning of November and will be used as the basis for the race to zero dialogues that will be kicking in in November. I'm pretty sure that we will hear from the high level climate champions a bit more about that in the in the final closing session. Um, but the idea really is to, to use these um, updated pathways for the process uh, leading up to COP26 um, and to uh, to really uh, well come come forward with them at COP26 for a higher level of ambition in all the sectors that are covered there, but for us relevant today uh, in the human settlements. Thank you very much. Martina, thank you very much for that comprehensive introduction to our session today. And of course, I look forward to welcoming you back uh, at the end of the session as I hand over to you uh, for the emceeing of the closing session. So everyone, all of our uh, audience members, please stay with us at the end of the session. Martina will be back and we will proceed with the closing session. Um, by the way, if any of you were wondering, uh, that disembodied voice <laughs> that uh, kindly offered technical advice belongs to Nora Steuer. She's also with Global ABC, and you will be meeting her later in connection with the Mentimeter poll. Speaking of which, I'd like to remind you all who are joining us to send us your questions via Microsoft Teams chat on the right hand side of your screen and go to menti.com for our online poll. And now let us turn to our panel of experts. Our first expert speaker joins us from Australia to talk about achieving a net zero built environment, what's needed in NDCs or nationally determined contributions and building standards. Allow me to introduce Dr. Peter Graham. He's the executive director of the Global Buildings Performance Network or GBPN which is a global network of local policy experts dedicated to achieving the mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions from the building sector. Peter has more than 20 years experience in international advocacy, research and education in sustainable building design, construction, evaluation and policy. He's also associate professor of architectural performance at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, and a technical advisor to the Global ABC. Peter, a warm welcome. Please unmute yourself, make sure your camera is on and the microphone is yours. Thanks so much, Marion. Um, it's a great pleasure to be part of this event. I'm going to share my screen and um, just check that you can see that slides there. Yes, so, works well, Peter, yeah. thanks. Perfect, Good, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So my job is to give you a quick briefing on how we translate some of the the actions which uh, Martina has laid out for us down into uh, the local, uh, the national and local levels through mechanisms such as the NDCs. To give you a summary of what I'm going to talk about, I think there are four basic actions that need to be incorporated to have building sector actions uh, take flight through the NDC process. The first one is to have ambitious sector specific targets. The second is to make sure that we have confidence uh, and commitment to regulatory reform, and that in fact, we have confidence in the evidence that um, building regulations really do create far more benefit than they, uh, than they cost. The third is to develop with some of the tools which have been laid out by Martina, a fundable implementation plan for actions which are included in NDCs. And finally, to make sure that the actions which are being, being proposed, being incorporated into NDCs, are really well aligned with other actions which are being proposed or in fact being implemented in countries, including adaptation actions and actions which are focused on non-climate drivers, including economic recovery. So I just could take a couple of minutes to go through these in a little bit more detail. So the first thing to point out is why we need ambitious sector specific targets in NDCs. We know that there are about 136 countries that mention buildings in some ways in their NDCs, but the level of ambition which is expressed in those commitments and actions is insufficient to meet the Paris goals. It's worth pointing out that successfully receiving funding through international climate finance does require ambition in proposed NDC programs and actions. So it really 
is important uh, to see the opportunity in setting ambitious targets for building sector actions. When we look at this in a little bit more detail, and you can have a look at the global status reports, which are put out by the Global ABC and are contributed to by GBPN and many other organisations in the world, you'll see that uh, the, the scope of um, energy and emission savings, which are captured by NDC commitments and existing policies is really only around about half of the total mitigation opportunity which exists. So in order to go further, we need to incorporate into our building sector actions and right into our NDCs improvements in performance for buildings. And that means really increasing efficiency and trying to, to develop mechanisms for increasing the investment in efficiency in technologies and building design uh, towards net zero performance. We also need to be thinking about increasing the scope of the actions which we include in NDCs. And so that will include things like increasing um, commitments to upgrading technologies and phase outs of inefficient technologies for fuel switching and trying to uh, eliminate fossil fuel use in buildings, particularly around heating and cooling, uh, encouraging the, the uh, incorporation of heat pump technologies and other things like that. Focusing on behaviour change and actions which can improve the, the, um, the energy conservation behaviour of, of building occupants and also making sure that we have got a scope which includes recognition of vernacular and biochromatic design and is covering the life cycle emissions. In the current set of, of standards around the world, we see much more representation for commercial buildings than residential buildings, and yet residential buildings are contributing more to the growth in greenhouse gas emissions from the building sector. So increasing scope to include renew, uh, um, residential and non-residential buildings, and also incorporating building renovations is really important. Finally, we need to be thinking about how the, the actions included in NDCs are integrated and connected with adaptation strategies, and particularly recognising that there's so many commitments, there's a vast uh, ecosystem of commitments which are being made in countries by non-state actors, private sector, by cities, many of which are more ambitious than the national commitments are. And so being able to understand what they are and aligning actions so that they contribute to supporting uh, achieving the national goals is, is a major opportunity. Okay, moving on to confidence and, and commitment to regulatory reform. Policy change in the building sector takes a long time. And so we need to have political will to stay the course and see reform uh, incorporated and enacted. Uh, a recent study that uh, GBPN uh, contributed to and, and I was the author of looked at the systematic reviews of building policy impacts and building, en building energy policy impacts over time. And we found that there was significant evidence of major um, positive economic and environmental benefits of incorporating ambitious building energy codes with packages of rating and disclosure policy as well as appliance standards and energy efficiency obligations, particularly for renovation of buildings. This led to significant economic, um, economic benefits, health benefits and environmental benefits. Uh, the process in Europe, just to give you an example, in one year, 2010 to 2011, avoided uh, the amount of emissions equivalent to around 11 coal-fired power stations. So it really is uh, an opportunity there and with a lot of know-how and a lot of experience internationally to guide actions. We also need to have fundable imp implementation plans. It's very important to set out a plan, of course, and a roadmap, but we have to be thinking about how we're going to actually take action and how we're going to see change occur over time. This is a process of continual improvement. It's not just a, a one-off project. And so you need to have local experts with uh, support for long-term engagement in local market reform. Some work that we're doing at the moment, looking at uh, where the NDCs and the framework for implementation of policy reforms are really working, shows that countries that uh, have designed their, their implementation plans to be fundable have a range of common elements ranging across issues of governance, such as having clear political commitments to change over time, common goals for the entire sector, 
that are ambitious, that are comprehensive, incorporating uh, different building types, different um, energy types and uh, so on. Having, an in, having a one coordinating body which can incorporate that integration vertically between different levels of government, local, state, national, and then on across the private sector and, uh, and civil society. And then having clear implementation uh, pathways as well, particularly starting out with a measured baseline so that you can monitor pr the progress towards achieving goals over time. So these are the kinds of criteria which, which investors are looking for in, um, in implementation plans. And these can be expressed in NDCs as well. So finally, looking at the alignment with the non-climate drivers. So when you analyse the, the way building sector is described in nationally determined contributions, you also see the building sector referred to in adaptation plans as well. And we've done a review of the way building sector is described and the kinds of issues which it's being, um, it's being thought of as, as contributing to, to solutions too. So what we found is that issues of, of equity of access to energy services and uh, economic development, innovation, health, dealing with, with climate change impacts like flooding, uh, heat waves and the concern for thermal comfort of people in buildings, affordable housing and resilience are really key. And so when we look more closely at the kinds of policy and policy settings and policy priorities that are coming up in the adaptation space, you can see some crossover with where we're, where we're looking at mitigation as well. So integrated planning, really important, looking at that relationship between the way buildings operate, buildings are designed and what they give to the city in terms of things like reducing urban heat island effect and encouraging transport oriented development not to mention providing frameworks for incorporating distributed supply of renewable energy. Regulations and standards, yes, we talk about them from the point of view of energy performance, but it's also an opportunity to look at the whole reform of the building codes so that they're fit for future climate risk, and particularly increasing mean temperatures and increasing extreme temperatures and weather. So that brings us to thermal comfort and the need for R&D. Uh, and I could go on, but you can see here that that some of these drivers are, are really much more in the realm of um, priority public policy initiatives. And given that we're living in the in the sort of the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, we're seeing an increasing frequency of, of climate change impacts as well. Uh, there is a, a great need for being able to develop a plan for policy reform in the building sector which does address multiple issues with simple policy solutions. And as I've mentioned before, you can have confidence that we know the kinds of policy measures and the kinds of policy reforms that are really gonna make a difference. So if you'd like more information on any of uh, the, these insights, the research behind them, you can contact me at the GBPN and you can uh, look at some of the tools that support translating the roadmaps to, to action at the Global ABC. And with that, I'll hand it over to you again, Marion. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. And there's so much in there. I always wish we had, of course, more time. But thank you for outlining some of the actions, the reforms and the targets needed to achieve a net zero built environment. And again, now I would like to remind everyone to send questions and comments to our panelists via Microsoft Teams on the right hand side of your screen and go to menti.com for our online poll. Our next speaker, Dr. Christine Lemaitre, is executive director of DGNB, the German Sustainable Buildings Council. And her topic today is transforming the buildings market through certification. Christine trained as a structural engineer, and after finishing her PhD, she worked for the then German construction company Bilfinger Berger in the field of resource efficient buildings. She joined the DGNB in 2009 and became CEO a year later in 2010. She's responsible for the council's thematic strategy and has initiated several national and international initiatives to raise awareness of the need for a sustainable built environment. Christine, welcome to the panel. Make sure you are unmuted. And now over to you. 
Well, thanks a lot, Marion. So I'm now trying as well to share my presentation. All right. Can you see that? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> but the system is sluggish, so never fear. We will keep on trying until until it works. As of now, we still see you. There we go. Something is happening. Okay, okay so it should yes. come up at least. We on see my the side. side, but I think you. That's it. Perfect. Okay. Lovely. All right. Okay, so yeah, thanks for having me, uh, and thanks actually to to Peter and Martina for their great uh, input. And uh, I'd like now for a few minutes to give maybe a little bit a different view on how we can achieve basically the goals of the Paris Agreement and even more. Um, through certification. Um, I think uh, we are all aware that there are many, many certifications in the world in, in different regions and, and they stay stand for different things and topics. Um, I'm a big believer, and this is what we work at DGNB for, into, into the tool of certification, because I think what we've heard so far is we the ambitions, we need to raise the ambition. The challenges are big, the opportunities are very big, um, but we need to move as well outside of the bubble. So the question is, you know, how can you really, really reach the whole value chain of, of construction all the way from the architects, the engineers to basically as well the clients, the investors who are paying for it um, all the way through the, the engineers, the construction companies to the people on the construction side and then to the user. And uh, I think a certification system um, if it has the right goals and if it has the right standards. And I think this is something I, I'd really like that we are challenged more by initiatives like the global ABCs as well as policies, because we, um, at least the DGNB system is a voluntary system. So we have the freedom to really push the market and pull the market into to different directions. And the other thing is one thing is we're talking about CO2 emissions today and the Paris Agreement is all about CO2 and energy, um, but construction and buildings is a holistic task. And I think we've heard already many things now with passive design and thermal comfort and, and it all interacts. And for that, we need a tool, an optimization tool that helps to set the goals in the beginning, but as well provides a quality assurance because you know, everyone always agrees that these topics are important, but there can go so many things can go wrong during design and on the construction side. And there is no quality assurance when it comes to um, codes and, and standards, in, at least in Germany. And I think this is in many other countries. The only topic that has uh, a quality assurance if it's completed the right way is the fire protection topic, but it's not about the CO2 emissions, no one is really coming back to check if you fulfill what you set out to, to achieve in the beginning. It, they don't look into, did you really use low carbon uh, materials? Do you really use materials which have a low uh, VOC, em VOC emissions or anything like that? And I think this is where certification plays a very important role to, to set the bar higher, to push ambition, uh, to reach out of the bubble, and to provide quality assurance. And I'd like always to show this picture because another thing certification can do, it generates data, it generates a lot of data. So we've certified more than 7,000 7, projects already and all these projects have done a life cycle analysis and LCA, they all have done life cycle costing, they all have achieved the very high requirements on building materials. So we have all this, this data. And um, when you look into what is the role of certification towards standards or regulations or what the government can do. Um, what we what we saw when we analyze, analyze, and anal, analyzed what we have certified, that basically in our certification system, if you just do what is required by law, you would achieve the 12%. That is far away from certification level in, in our system. But the average we certify in the office space is already at the gold standard. And I think this is something where you can see what certification can do as well what kind of responsibility certification has, but that there's already a market standard out there we have to make transparent to understand that maybe we can have even more ambitious codes, codes and regulations and really make policymakers understand that the market can already move and that we're able today as well to build 
carbon neutral or as we call it carbon positive buildings and this is the last basically message I would like to to send across is that we are already able to do that and um, we launched last year a new um, award system based on our certification it's called climate positive because we like to use that term because one thing is to have a carbon neutral building um, but what we, what we need is to have more ambitious buildings because we kind of need to balance out the buildings, existing buildings or buildings who cannot be as ambitious. And the other thing is, to be honest, in construction, um, we we don't have this very high um, accuracy on, on how we design. So normally a building that is being designed as a carbon neutral building, they do it right. They will do everything they can and in the end these buildings can be and will be carbon positive during operation. And what we did is we awarded um, the first buildings, existing buildings who are provenly carbon positive. So they generate more energy than they um, consume over a period of 12 months, including the user consumption without compensation. So basically all the energy they are providing um, or they need are generated on site. Um, and uh, we we basically showed that it's already possible today. So one picture I'm showing here is the Freiburg City Hall. That's Freiburg is a city in the south of Germany. Um, and that building is carbon positive over 12 months. It has a kindergarten attached to it. It has a cafeteria inside. So we look as well at this kind of user consumption and still the building is able it is so energy efficient. It generates so much energy through PV systems in the facade. You see it on the roof and um, that it's really proven based on the real performance data. It is a carbon positive building and another uh, point coming as well to the passive design approach, which I think is really the key we have to the key message we have to send, especially to companies in the global south uh, uh, countries. Stay with passive design. You have such a great history and culture of of dealing with these high climate uh, challenges. And I think now in the northern part of, of the world, we actually we need to learn from the global south countries. And this building um, uh, down here, it's an educational building in Singapore from the university. And we awarded them as well the climate positive award because that building is carbon neutral as well. And it works without active cooling. It is basically has high ceiling fans and if you keep the room temperature very high and the air is moving, you don't feel that as a draft, but more as something that is refreshing. And the engineers, they worked with this kind of principle, which has been known for for decades, basically in southern countries um, that a certain slow moving air in a high temperature room, um, people feel comfortable and uh, therefore they were able in this very challenging climate of Singapore to um, achieve a building which is climate positive and I think we can do it today and I think this is the positive mess message and I think we need to scale it. We need to reach out of our expert bubble and out of the sustainability bubble um, and I think their certification systems can play a very important role and I think we need to challenge them more. I think we have to push them harder. Um, we always have to look behind the label so this is my input, so thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity and I hand back to Marian. Thank you. And thank you, Christine. It's such an inspiring message and especially also seeing those carbon positive buildings. Wonderful and great work. Thank you for that interesting presentation. And now we move to our next panelist, Christiana Hageneda, who will share her insights on moving to action from regional to national roadmaps. Christiana is head of program for the PEEB, P -E -E -B, which stands for Program for Energy Efficiency in Buildings within GIZ, the German International Development Agency. She's an architect and an energy efficiency expert and has headed the PEEB secretariat since 2018, based at the French Development Bank. The PEEB is a French-German joint program that supports countries around the world on their way to decarbonize the buildings and construction sector. Welcome, Christiana, and I invite you to jump right in. If you've demuted yourself and put your camera on, the stage is now yours. Thank you very much, Marian. There you are. Um, yes, I understand you can see my image and I will share um, my screen with you. And I hope you can see my presentation. 
I'll let you know if we can't. And there it is. We see your there slide. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And you can see the presentation mode, I guess. Yes, it looks it looks perfect. Very good. So thank you very much for having me today. Um, I want to invite you to come with me to move from the building level. We just heard from Christine uh, up to the country level. And I would like to show you how a country can move to action because this is uh, absolutely necessary. Uh, we saw also at the beginning of uh, this event today uh, a presentation by Martina showing that there are roadmaps and these roadmaps were developed by the members of the Global ABC jointly. Um, the, the eight uh, areas that Mar Martina described uh, were developed and they are very, very useful to guide also a country on a national level through uh, getting actions and define actions uh, what they can do in the buildings and construction sector. So this is a very useful tool that uh, can guide a country to define actions and link them to the NDCs. Because what we see is that NDCs are not actionable. So there is normally and often not uh, targets set for the NDCs in the building sector. And this is very, very important uh, because it can also galvanize financial support and technical support from others if you have set your targets. Um, um, this is why I want to present you what we do in the PEEP, the program for energy efficiency in buildings. Um, we help countries to define targets and we help countries to, to bring actions to the building sector to decarbonize that sector. Um, the PEEP was set up uh, two and a half years ago and it is working under the roof of the Global ABC. It is a joint uh, German and French partnership and uh, we support several countries on their way to decarbonize the sector. Um, and when I say we, you can see the donors on the lower part of uh, the slide. This, as I already said, a uh, German Ministry of Environment and uh, from the French side, we have several donors. We have uh, also the uh, Ministry of Environment from France. We also have the French Environmental Fund and we have the AFD who are donors and implementers are uh, again, the AFD, it's the, the French Development Bank, it's the GIZ, and I'm part of that, uh, and uh, it's ADEM, the French Energy Management Agency, and we have set up a secretariat uh, that is situated in AFD in Paris, and from that we have created uh, in our partner countries uh, small offices where we help our partner countries to decarbonize set targets uh, and decarbonize uh, their sector. Um, we want to um, give action in a way that they have a possibility until 2050, of course, um, to see in which areas they have to uh, be active. And as Peter said before uh, already, uh, residential sector is in many countries essential uh, because it is a huge consumer, energy consumer. Um, and here I brought uh, with me an example of Morocco, a partner country, <coughs> Morocco. And later you can see um, our partner country, Vietnam, or what they did uh, with uh, actioning their NDC roadmap. Christiana, uh, excuse yes. me for interrupting you, but uh, we have not been seeing your slides. We still see your original slide. If you can try to move those forward. I do, I do. They are, they are moving, but you cannot see them. I, on my screen, I see slide one of yeah. six. Same here, same here, Christiana. I think maybe it might okay. be useful if you try to share again. I think it got stuck. If you unshare and share again and we can, can see. Can you see it now? No, we still see the original one, I'm afraid. OK, so I unshare and share it again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you see it now? Uh, yes. Now we see but another slide. Yes, we do. Exactly. Yes. If you go to uh, okay. full screen mode, I think it's, it's yes. probably working now. I do that. 
You can see it now. Hang on, it's just, uh, yeah, there it is. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's yes. on the screens. Okay, so um, here is again uh, the visualization of our setup of our program, the PEEP, the Program for Energy Efficiency in Buildings, and you can see the members of our program and the partner countries where we work. Um, and I will now go to the next slide, and I hope you can see it. Can you see it now, the next slide? Yes, there. Yep, Morocco. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. So now the slides are moving. This is fine. And uh, the example of Morocco. Um, I brought with me the example of a residential uh, national program, a support program. Uh, as as I mentioned already, residential sector is very important and crucial for decarbonizing uh, the, the sector. And we advise and support uh, the Ministry for Habitat in uh, Morocco, how they can set up such a program uh, targeting the residential sector. Uh, and we have uh, uh, a setup of uh, investment of 180 million. Um, and it will be in partnership with a national housing developer, it's Alamran, and also in connection with uh, equipment, uh, a bank that gives loans to uh, households that buy uh, very energy efficient equipment. So this is a combination of two things. One, you have uh, the, the envelope, the building, at, as an envelope and you have on the other side the equipment because equipments are also very important and you need to make sure that uh, they have the low energy efficient uh, high energy efficiency level mm. and this sector will allow and we hope that we can start with this program next year uh, and this program will allow for the new construction to really show how it can uh, reduce the energy consumption on the building level, but also with uh, the equipment. This is one example I just wanted to share with you that our program is advising uh, the ministries and our, our partner countries with. Uh, and also when they set targets and when they have uh, a roadmap, they can bring in such measures, such programs, bring into that uh, national roadmap and see how they uh, proceed. And then they will uh, have a monitoring in five years, in 10 years, how this program and one of these action, this is just one action, how they can uh, improve their energy efficiency. And I want to mention another thing. Um, we see now uh, in this time of COVID crisis, we also see an economic crisis. And uh, we know from uh, previous uh, uh, crisis, economic crisis, that the construction sector is definitely a very good tool to stimulate the economy. So having such a program, setting up such a program will on the one hand stimulate the economy and on the other hand, direct the economy towards a green economy because you will have green buildings with that and this is going exactly in the right direction. So you have a stimulation of uh, economy, you will have jobs that are created and they will be in the green segment. And this is where we want to really go and advise our partner countries. Um, as I said, uh, we advise on financing but also on policies, how to set roadmaps, how to improve building codes or set policy, uh, building codes. And of course, capacity building is going on, but also financing. Uh, we have with uh, the French Development uh, Agency, we have a good financing partner who has already set a pipeline of over 2 billion uh, euro that uh, they uh, see on the horizon in many countries. So this is a very good, hopeful pipeline that uh, we help, uh, we, we hope to implement in the coming years. Um, and this is from my side. Thank you very much. I hope you could see the slides that uh, were sliding and uh, any questions anytime. Thank you very much. Back to you, Marion. Yeah, thanks, Christiana. And yes, the slides did work out in the end and uh, they were very interesting. Thank you. And thanks also for your concrete examples, if you'll excuse the pun, of PEEB's work on moving to action with regard to regional and national roadmaps. Now here is another quick reminder to please submit your questions and comments via Teams chat 
and go to menti.com for our online poll. Now, staying with the previous theme of moving to action from regional to national roadmaps is our fourth and final speaker today, who will focus on the development of Vietnam's NDC roadmap for low carbon and climate resilient buildings. And by the way, Kim Thoa jumped in at the last minute for a colleague. So thank you, Kim, for that. Kim Thoa is Senior Project Officer with the GIZ, the German International Development Agency, in the GIZ Vietnam office. She's been working alongside a number of departments, agencies and institutes under the Ministry of Construction, MOC. And in the past 20 years, she's also provided technical assistance to the ministry and to construction departments from various city governments. In 2018, she was delegated by the MOC to speak at the APEC Summit in Da Nang. And in 2019, she facilitated Vietnam's interdepartmental delegation to Germany for the development of the program on energy efficiency in the building sector. She also helped to review the development of Vietnam's NDC roadmap for a low carbon climate resilient buildings and construction sector in Vietnam, vision to 2050. And recently, Kim co-authored the feasibility study on green financing for the energy efficient and low emission housing market in Vietnam. Kim, hello and welcome. And thank you so much for jumping in. Please open your microphone and camera and tell us more. There you are. Okay, please go ahead. We can see you and I think we can hear you as well. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, inviting uh, Vietnam to join. I'm uh, very happy today to uh, actually speak on behalf of uh, the Ministry of Construction, who is uh, um, actually uh, the <coughs> The ministry to the, the main counterpart of the um, <coughs> who, who really developed the national uh, roadmap, NDC roadmap for, uh, for, for, for building sector in Vietnam. Actually, the work the, in Vietnam, we have the two separate work. One is the roadmap already issued by Ministry of Construction is a little bit ahead of the NAT. Uh, NDC roadmap that we build under the methodology of uh, uh, and under under methodology of global ABC. So, um, however, the roadmap uh, published and announced by Ministry of Construction last last month is a more or less like uh, the 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 guideway and then the gateway to more in emphasis in the adaptation. They set, set out for, uh, for, <clears throat> um, for tasks. One is uh, for adaptation, the other for mitigation and prepare the resources and then develop the MRV system. So um, particular on building and construction sector is more, uh, need more um, <coughs> detailing. And that's why MOC also support PIP to, I mean, buy in the PIP uh, technical uh, assistant to develop the NDC roadmap along um, in line with the methodology developed by uh, Global ABC and, uh, and, and PIP. So, um, as you can see in, uh, <clears throat> uh, in, in, in Vietnam, construction sector and buildings is really fast growing within our uh, fast growing economic development nowadays. So 30% of the total energy consumption is uh, mainly come from the residential. And oh, excuse me, excuse me for interrupting, but we cannot see your slides. If you are putting up slides, we cannot see them at the moment. We check it. Okay, ah, there we go. Okay. Okay. They are now appearing. So, so and we, we just need, excuse me, we just need to put them into presentation mode. Okay. As well. Thank All you. right, there we go. Perfect. Thank you oh, very much. Thank you. So, um, 
the the main the main work done in Vietnam now is uh, uh, by as a side by the prime minister is uh, how to really put commitment of Vietnamese government to implement the Paris Agreement in the whole economy. So actually leading the work is the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources, Monre, and then it um, delegated by the Prime Minister um, to, to really the focal point for the whole economy. So Monre is now also spent time to develop a roadmap for implementation of Paris Agreement, try to figure out how much it could be contributed from different economic sectors, including building and construction sector. However, the, that work is uh, still on the way done by Ministry of Environment in terms of how to really achieve the 9% of 8 or 9% of the reduction of GHG emission uh, with all of the local resources and uh, the government even have make a bigger ambition to reach the 25.7 percent of reduction in uh, in GHG emission if we if Vietnam could get further support from international countries. So in order to achieve those commitment, Monre is now building up the roadmap for implemented for realization of Paris Agreement commitment by the government of Vietnam. And so far, however, so far we still don't get the percentage given to building and construction sector yet. However, Ministry of Construction is really go ahead to set up in the last uh, last month uh, by uh, decision of Minister of Construction to to push up a action plan to implement the Paris Agreement for the until the year 2030, and this will be our legal corridor for us to further um, develop the uh, NDC roadmap for building sector and construction sector as a, as a we are doing now under PIP and Global ABC. Yeah, so the approach here we really following the, the structure suggested by Global ABC in regional roadmap for Asia. So our consultant working in hands with the government officer from Ministry of Construction and Ministry of, Mon of Monre and Ministry of Environment and Resources really review the regional roadmap, global ABC regional roadmap, and then seeing what could be relevant for Vietnam and what could be potentially implementable in Vietnam, and then put it up. And now we are in the final step to receive their final draft and then Coming in next month, we'll get presented it to the Ministry of Construction for buying in, for getting buying in by 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 Ministry Ministry of Construction first, and then all of the department subordinated to Ministry of Construction later. But also during that process, Monre also sending their staff to John so that what is doing under Ministry of Construction is a well informed and well coordinated with the focal point of the government on on action plan to, to implement Paris Agreement. Yeah, so you can see in our presentation, uh, in, in our slide that the approach and objective is uh, um, pointed out alongside with the government of Vietnam, action plan to implement uh, Paris Agreement. It's across eight key activity uh, alongside with the, the regional roadmap. And then it can be seen as a steering instrument However, it's subject to the current the current regulation in Vietnam with the regular revision to make it more applicable. So uh, <clears throat> the vision on how the NDC roadmap could be developed for Vietnam when we see it and then discuss with the ministry that okay, since uh, September last year, uh, we received the regional uh, we joining the MOC joining the global ABC regional roundtable Asia Pacific I think in Bangkok and then we have representative also from the private sector from the um, housing and uh, real estate association so that really accompany with the governance done by the Ministry of Construction private sector also joining hand from the very very first beginning so until 
uh, March of this year, we 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 receiving and reviewing the regional roadmap methodology, uh, also the international one, and then the, try to see that it really a good one and highly appreciated by our expert and professional in the in the field of architecture, uh, urban planning, um, building material development, and all of those. They see their role in the methodology developed by the regional roadmap through the eight activity. So our consultant and, and our staff from the Ministry of Construction have, have been working very, uh, very delicately to get um, survey and get the feedback from all the professional practitioners in Vietnam to answer the survey so that we can base on those vision to develop the to to detailing or to um, formulating the roadmap for Vietnam based on the methodology given and review. So the, the survey has been done in the, uh, for the eight activity across the broad, um, broad range of, of, of experts to get it done. And then until now, November 2020, we have uh, we are preparing a technical stakeholder consultation uh, internally in Vietnam first so that they can freely speak within our language, within our regulation, and then we intend planning to have in this, uh, the, the second technical stakeholder consultation open to international by the end of November or early of December, right or not? Yep. Yeah, and then that is uh, in agreement with Ministry of Construction. We know that it's a hard way to go because the methodology provided is a really innovative, comprehensive, and it, it, it needs really our leading expert to join um, so that it can be done. It cannot be done with, within a, a small group, but a broad range of expert to contribute to that. And then we really need to work hard to get the attention and the buy-in from Ministry of Construction to that. Because actually for them, they have the paper already. The action plan to implement Paris agreement is uh, in place. But that is a more like umbrella legal document. And now we are really go down to more sectoral abroad. That, that's what uh, perceives in Vietnam. And then we hope that uh, coming early next year, the roadmap can be approved somehow from the Ministry of Construction and it can go into a realization or implementation. Yeah. Alongside with that, those are what will be when uh, be in, in our vision is that those things will be incorporated in the NDC building sector platform. Here's our language, but actually in the broader term of the whole economy, NDC roadmap uh, developed and coordinated by Monre, uh, they they don't see building as a a a a, um, a separate a separate sector. Uh, as a building and transportation is still under the Category say, saying uh, for energy use, you, you know, you, you know the methodology for for NDC roadmap. They put it as a, uh, energy use in that category. So, however, we try to to work hard to um, also in Vietnam the transportation sector also working very hard so that they can see the contribution clearly from each sector to the whole commitment done by Vietnamese government. Chuan, uh, if I may ask you to wrap up, we are running out of time. Uh, if you could just move to your concluding statement, that would be very helpful. Thank you very much. The, the last slide, slide uh, only a few more. That is the challenge we have to do it because uh, even during the, um, the roadmap in Vietnam, we, we are we, we facing the challenge or, or some barrier of excessively uh, lack of data and then um, uh, and then also with the government setting the common goal separately for building sector can, can be done right now or a little bit delay a little bit uh, through the buy-in process. And then uh, because of you see here, at least five ministries need to be coordinated. So the inter interdepartmental coordination is really, really needed. And we even sometimes thinking about needing the uh, intervention from the government office. And that is the own challenge we want to share with you. So uh, I would like to wrap up our talk now and thank you very much for your patience.
Kim, thank you so much uh, for sharing how Vietnam is approaching NDC roadmap development for climate friendly buildings and construction sector. That was highly interesting. And a big thank you once more to all of our expert panelists for your thought provoking and informative presentations. Moving right along as we are a little tight on time, uh, we will transition now to the Q&A part of this session. And a final reminder, uh, submit your questions if you haven't done so uh, via the chat panel in Microsoft Teams and go to menti.com for our online poll. So the time has come now for you, our online audience, to share center stage with us and our expert speakers. As promised, just before we challenge our panelists with your questions and comments, we'll kick off the interactive part of the session with the long-awaited results of the Mentimeter poll, presented today by Nora Steuber, Program Management Officer with the Global ABC, which, as you'll remember, is one of this year's 10M organizers. Nora, over to you. Thank you, Marian, and uh, thanks uh, to our distinguished panelists. This was uh, great, really, really interesting insights, and thanks to all of our attendees for participating in our mentee poll. It's really, really uh, great to hear what you have to say, and we will be using this for the results of the TEMM and for our summaries, and uh, I would like to jump right in. Uh, the first thing that we asked our attendees was, in your opinion, what is currently lacking for moving to scale, because obviously that is the topic of today's TEM, uh, how we can move solutions to scale. Um, now, I think this is a, this is a very nice result, um, and I want to highlight a couple of things. Obviously, you can see here that the first choice of answer is key regulation, which is uh, which links very well to what Peter said on NDCs and also what Martina was presenting on the roadmaps, and of course our last speaker from Vietnam, Kim Thua, um, on the NDC and buildings roadmaps. So this is clearly recognized as key. Uh, I want to highlight something here. We put in solutions. I know this is a little vague, but we do this on purpose because what we do here sometimes is, yes, yes, you know, we, we, we need to move uh, the building sector forward, but there are solutions that are missing or there are technologies that are not yet there. That doesn't seem to be the view of our audience and uh, we certainly agree with you, dear audience, that the solutions are there um, and that uh, much more important is the setting than ABLAS, if you will. Um, moving to the next one, in your opinion, what is key to a transformative building's nationally determined contribution? And Peter uh, spoke very nicely to that. Of course, in our opinion, all of these are important and we see that you share our view, um, but comes out on top a little bit uh, compared to the others as a commitment to net zero. And indeed, this is key to framing the NDC and to being able to uh, formulate good measures and targets that are ambitious enough. So again, uh, thank you so much for responding to that. And um, the last question here is which stakeholders need to be on board for successful building sector transformation? We gave you a couple of options and what we see here is that the first option chosen is national government. Um, we don't have, uh, from our end, we don't say that one group is more important than the other. We see that this value chain is fragmented and we see that if we don't have everyone on board, we, we, we can't move forward. Certainly true though that national governments, again, they set a framework and they're key for enablers. Um, and uh, just um, my two cents, scientific institutions, certainly very, very important to those who are listening as well. And um, obviously they provide the data between, be behind everything. So well, but with that, uh, back to you, Marion. Thanks so much for um, participating in our Menti. It's really great. We will be using these results. Of course, they're not representative, but they do give us a snapshot of what our audience think. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Nora, for that uh, galloping many Mentimeter poll. And I do apologize that uh, we are a bit behind time. So I will jump right in now to the Q&A, some of the questions which have been coming in thick and fast. And the first question is directed at Peter and or Martina. Um, and I would ask you to please again, try to keep your answers a little bit brief, one or two sentences if you can. Here's the question for Peter and or Martina, whoever wishes to jump in. What are the financing opportunities available for reducing embodied carbon across the building life cycle for the building sector in Africa? And the second part of that question, how do data gaps on embodied carbon impact financing? Let's go with the first part first. What are the financing opportunities available for reducing embodied carbon across the building life cycle for the building sector in Africa? Who wants to take that? 
Uh, if you could please all just uh, come back on camera, by the way, everybody come back on camera, but leave your microphones muted until um, you are called upon. That's great. And Martina, I think you uh, you appeared first, so <laughs> you're ahead of the pack. Please go ahead. Right. And I would like to do a bit of a promotional thing here because this week uh, we do present, we launch our Africa roadmap. And uh, so I want to to, uh, to invite you to to join that uh, that presentation, that launch. And uh, and in the in the roadmap document, you will find a dedicated chapter. As I said, uh, financial tools are mentioned for each of the priority areas, so including for the materials section. Um, and uh, there's a whole list of, of things that are being presented that range from urban development funds to infrastructure funds to dedicated credit lines, preferential tax, carbon pricing, grants and rebates, uh, procurement purchase and lease and uh, uh, and so on. So there is uh, a whole host of things that is available and in the interest of time, I would stop here. OK, great. Thank you so much. And then why don't I go to Peter for the second part of that question, if you wish to answer it, and that is how do data gaps on embodied carbon impact financing? Well, you know, we're, we're looking to see the return on investment. And so when there are data gaps, uh, it's hard to know whether or not you're getting your, your money's worth. So yeah, data is really important. And we found in, in global studies of, uh, you know, the barriers to investment in, in uh, decarbonizing the building sector, that indeed there, where, even where data does exist and there's a, there's a high level of evidence, there's still a mistrust of data, particularly in the private sector. Um, and so, yes, it is indeed a, an issue. Uh, the, other, the other aspect of this, of course, from the research that we've done shows that there is a, it's certainly a, um, a perceived risk more than a real risk, because we also know a, a lot about the embodied energy uh, and embodied emissions of, of common building materials, and we know where the priorities should be. So uh, it is an issue, but it's certainly not insurmountable. Thank you. And uh, by the way, if any of you uh, wish to add something to that uh, desperately, just put up your hand and, and, and jump in. Um, but barring that, we will go on now to Christine. There's a question for you. Do you see capacity constraints in developing countries to implement certification schemes? There is a second part to the question, but let's do the first one first. Christine, this one's for you. Yeah, no, not at all. I think it's uh, it depends uh, on on which certification scheme you would choose. Um, but and I think the most important thing is that a certification scheme is uh, based on the local technical possibilities and the local codes and standards. But I think um, if you would adapt our philosophy, where basically you try to push them then to voluntarily do more than they have to do. Uh, in, in many areas such as materials, uh, biodiversity, energy and so forth. Um, I think that would work in every country and actually I would like to see it in every country um, that we would have a tool where basically the private market, the investors, companies who are not from the construction business but who um, have buildings and need buildings have a tool to be pushed and motivated um, to think more about sustainable buildings and their responsibility um, with their buildings to the built environment. And the second part of that question, if you wish to take that too, is what level of regulatory support do certification schemes need to be truly successful at scale? Hmm. Not too much, I would uh, I would say. Um, I think uh, what we would need or what would really help would if the financial institutions and the financial tools uh, would support certification as a quality assurance tool. I mean, this is actually happening now in Brussels with the taxonomy uh, movement and criteria, but I think this would be a big part globally um, because what I said uh, in my presentation, certification is to raise the bar in ambition, but as well as a quality assurance tool. And I think if we close the gap and make the financial sector understand if money is being invested in buildings or city districts, and they ask or they want to see a quality assurance such as a certification, I think that would be um, a very big driver because regulations, um, they always try to kind of raise the bar for everyone. So I think they are a tool from, from the bottom. A certification is something very ambitious in the front, 
And to bring these two lines closer together, I think it is more um, a question of support from financial institutions uh, and banks. Thank you. And I see a lot of people, a lot of your colleagues here nodding on the screen. So thank you for that answer. <laughs> Thank we you. have now a question for Christiana. Uh, this is um, a question about Rwanda. A question for you from Rwanda, excuse me. Is embodied carbon across building life cycle considered in the Morocco Green Housing Program? Thank you very much. I think it's very interesting that there are several uh, questions about embodied carbon. Uh, this is good news because uh, this means that uh, this very important issue that is for a long time have been has been overlooked is uh, getting more importance um, for the Moroccan scheme. I think we are not uh, on the development of the criteria there. It's the Moroccan uh, Al Alamran who is developing the criteria and I think they didn't yet uh, set all the criteria. So I will I cannot say yes or no. I will have a look. I hope definitely that uh, it will be one of the criteria. But uh, specifically for uh, Africa, since the question comes from Rwanda, uh, we saw it also with other countries that uh, since uh, many buildings are not the big consumer of energy, we see much more importance in the building, in the, in the use of building materials, because there the embodied carbon is a bigger issue if you analyze where the energy is when you have the building in the operation or more in the setup of uh, the structure of the building. So um, definitely this is a huge issue there and uh, building for example local materials with less carbon inside is something that could be and I hope will be also very important economically for the countries. So uh, we also try to advise the countries uh, to have a look at their construction industry uh, and bring up uh, building materials that maybe earlier have been used but are not used uh, nowadays uh, because they are less in industrialized and uh, we are uh, cooperating here also with ADEM, uh, the uh, French energy agency, uh, to have some programs in several countries. So this is a big issue. All right, thank you very much. And I think we have a question here for Kim. Let me just see if I can, I can find that. Um, uh, just a moment. I just saw that, Kim, and this will probably, here we are, and this will probably be the final question, I'm afraid. So, Kim, what can other countries in the Southeast Asian region learn from Vietnam's efforts on developing the building's NDC roadmap? If you can give me that answer in two or three sentences, that would be lovely. Thank you so much. Um, we cannot hear you. I think you have to unmute your microphone. Ah, okay, sorry. Oh, yeah, no. I think basically um, um, the starting point will be the coordination among the focal ministry, Monre, and with all of the line ministry. So with our coordination, the NDC uh, action plan or uh, roadmap could not be done in a harmonizing uh, for the entire economy. And secondly, um, with that, the data gap will also be uh, overcome when when we have better coordination because the data is, does not mean we don't have data. The data is scattered and then storing in different format and uh, maybe not really talking to each other. I mean, not in the same uh, the same uh, maze line or something. So so when better coordination can be done, then then the the NDC roadmap can be can can be realized. And with other country, maybe in the region they also doing, but in some different approach that that we like we do before we have the NDC roadmap from the and uh, the global ABC, the government already go ahead with the top down approach, and now we have the sectoral approach. So I don't know other country already started look at our uh, global ABC uh, roadmap uh, methodology to go ahead. So I believe. Uh, this is a good methodology to follow and then if uh, more country from the region follow then we have the same basis for uh, for, for uh, comparison and, and also seeing the baseline for the region. I don't know whether that answer is good. 
enough. Again, I see all the heads nodding, so we'll take that as a resounding yes. Thank you so much, uh, Kim, for your final answer to that final question. And um, I would also like to say this discussion has been incredibly interesting. Wish we could keep you on screen for at least half a day to continue with uh, and bring forth all your interesting ideas, comments and, um, and knowledge and expertise. So unfortunately, that's all we have time for in terms of Q&A today. Thank you so much, all the panelists and expert speakers and all the participants as well online uh, for your abundant enthusiasm, your participation, and for, of course, your amazing inputs and your interesting information. All of that will be used to inform recommendations for policymakers going forward. So thank you. I will now proceed with a very galloped session summary, so I'll try to speed through this as best I can. Now, um, here we go. So here is an edited shortened version. Today we heard about how what is needed in NDCs and building standards is ambitious spec sector specific targets, a commitment to regulatory reform and implementation plan that is fundable, and the alignment with adaptation and non-climate drivers such as flooding for example, or affordability or health, important in these COVID times. On the subject of transforming the building's market through certification, we learned how certification can help push and pull the market to realize better buildings which are in line with the Paris Agreement, how voluntary certification can help to explore and demonstrate already existing market capabilities, which in turn um, will then um, inspire policymakers and uh, decision makers to, uh, to further increase their good work in terms, oops, lost that, will further increase their good work uh, in terms of the, um, in terms of the sector. Sorry, couldn't read that. In this session, we were reminded of some sobering statistics that buildings and construction are responsible for almost 40% of energy and process related emissions. 36% of final energy demand, and almost 50% of waste globally. The inevitable conclusion was that we need to decarbonize this essential sector if we're to achieve the Par Paris Agreement goals and many of the sustainable development goals. We also saw, exa saw examples of how the PEEB, the French-German Support Program for Energy Efficiency in Buildings, supports countries with technical and financial assistance and how advice from the PEEB is in sync with the guiding principles of roadmaps that were jointly developed by global ABC members. We were also invited to take a look at how Vietnam has developed its NDC roadmap for a low carbon construction sector and climate resilient buildings, and how this was propelled by decisions by the Prime Minister and the Minister of Construction to implement the Paris Agreement with a view to zero emissions from the building sector by 2050. In addition, we heard about some challenges facing Vietnam, such as insufficient data and a lack of agreement and coordination by experts and institutions on common goals. And finally, we were given details of how, based on the global ABC regional roadmap, Vietnam's approach and objectives include tangible targets and measurable actions common goals, targets, and timelines for key actions, government guidance for key stakeholders, and regular revisions and updates to the NDC roadmap, which is being used as a steering instrument. And that is it for the summary. With that, we do come to the end of this session. Um, I would like to close by borrowing a phrase from our panelists. I think, Christiana, you said this at some point with a reminder that the buildings and construction sector is the sleeping giant of climate change, something the experts have long realized and something that translates into a call to action, especially to global policymakers to fully wake that giant up and take the built environment a giant step forward toward a climate smart and climate friendly future. With that, we come to the end of session three of this 10M, but please stay with us for the closing session of this year's technical expert meeting on mitigation, which starts in just a moment. Many thanks to all of our expert speakers 
And of course, to you, our online audience around the world for your enthusiastic participation. Accolades also once more to the organizers, the tireless UNF C Secretariat team and the Global ABC. Goodbye from me, Marion Canute. Be safe, be well. And I now hand over to the Master of Ceremonies for the closing session, Global ABC's Martina Otto. Thank you very much, uh, Marion, um, and thanks to all our panelists uh, today. We are now coming to the closing session um, of this series of uh, three uh, TMM uh, sessions that we had. Um, and I think we had a very rich, rich debate with uh, a lot of examples from policymakers and experts from around the world um, on key challenges and solutions, specifically cool buildings for all, enhancing circularity in the built environment and developing pathways for moving to scale. And uh, it's next to impossible to do justice to the richness of the debates that we that we did have. And uh, we're already 10 minutes late. I was told that we can stay a few more minutes and I hope you will all have the time um, to bear with us uh, a few more minutes, uh, but I'll try and be as short as possible. And I would like to welcome um, Orvis Sarmat, uh, Deputy Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and Gonzalo Munoz, the high-level climate champion of Chile. We're really, really honored and delighted that you're both with us uh, for this closing session, and uh, you'll have the final words after uh, my brief summary of the sessions. And uh, with that, um, if you if you like to to switch on your cameras to to, to so that everybody can see you, that's welcome. Um, if not, when you want to speak, um, it, it's up to you. Uh, the first session on cool buildings for all. Um, during that, we learned that cooling in buildings contributes greatly to global warming, and in a warming world, energy demand due to cooling will be rising or is rising rapidly. So it's a vicious circle that has been created and that we need to break. Um, otherwise, uh, we uh, will be outpacing um, the improvements that have been made on energy efficiency uh, in, in buildings. And uh, what, it, what is needed is uh, to address cooling demand. Uh, we, de we need a holistic approach uh, along the lines of avoid, shift and improve. Uh, so in the first place, we need to reduce the need for mechanical cooling. And to achieve this, we have a uh, a number of options from passive designs to uh, cool roofs to nature-based solutions, uh, both uh, at the building and at the city level, um, as well as all the way to uh, the promotion of sustainable construction materials that naturally control thermal comfort and humidity. Um, and we heard a lot of examples that I now will skip in the interest uh, of of time, but I really wanted to emphasize uh, the options that we that we do have here. Um, to combine as well the issues of environment and health, very importantly, by creating more healthy environments in the buildings. Um, also with the natural um, ventilation, for example, options uh, to, to improve uh, air quality uh, indoors and to uh, also reduce uh, well the risk of spread of airborne Ill illnesses, uh, very timely to, to mention. Um, if we look at the sustainable materials, there's a lot of opportunities that come as well from the agricultural sector, looking at agricultural waste, for example, uh, for, or, or agricultural produce for a bioeconomy uh, to have, for example, um, insulation materials and so on. And for this to really work, we need local ecosystems and markets. So we need to build these value chains um, uh, for, for these options to be perceived as viable and desirable. Um, so there is a there is an effort to be made. And if we talk about the nature based solutions I already mentioned, um, this is both at the building level uh, with green roofs and green facades, but as much um, uh, at uh, the city scale with more green spaces and uh, the, um, the planning actually how buildings are uh, exposed. And uh, so that's a real call for not only thinking at the building level, but to take into account urban planning and design strategies. Um, so that was to the avoid uh, uh, angle of the avoid shift and proof. Um, for shifting, we talked quite a bit about uh, the possibility, for example, of district energy 
uh, where uh, we can use uh, excess heat for cooling, where we can use water bodies locally available uh, for cooling, as well as the integration of renewable energy. And uh, that's a really good measure to keep in mind. Um, in terms of improvements, uh, obviously, then we have to look at uh, super efficient appliances, uh, so all the technology choices that are there, but not only technology, also the behavioral choices that we that we can make um, with the nudges and technologies such as sensors and control systems, uh, but also some devices that are really interesting and coming up on the market that take us away from looking um, at space cooling, but more at thermal comfort, so bringing it closer to, to people. Um, and uh, what was really important in that session was uh, that we need in enablers, uh, so the buy-in from local and national government, uh, uh, for example, through cooling and heat reduction action plans and uh, cooling related commitments into nationally determined contributions. And uh, really the summary of the session one was um, that there is an urgent need to rethink how we use and cool buildings around the world. Uh, but that uh, technical poli policy and financial solutions already exist. They're ready to be implemented at scale. Um, these solutions need to be tailored to local uh, physical and social circumstances and supported by buy-in from and awareness raising uh, and technical capacity building of national and sub-national policy makers. So that was session one. Session two was on building back better. Uh, mobilizing the value chain towards circularity, focused on the enormous potential um, that a circularity approach has for the built environment and vice versa. And uh, it's clear the sector is very material intense uh, and has as an additional challenge that key building materials that are being used at the moment, such as cement and steel, do come with high carbon footprints, but that are relatively hard to crack as well. Um, but uh, we can significantly reduce our environmental impact and uh, the resource impact by moving um, towards greater circularity by looking at uh, alternative building materials uh, as, as well. And uh, in line with this idea of keeping materials as long as possible at the highest value possible in the economic system, uh, the call was made for seeing construction waste as a resource the opportunity for alternative building materials and looking for construction techniques that do reduce waste in the first place. Things like more modularity, but also the new innovations with uh, 3D printing and uh, and so on. So for this work uh, to work, we need to focus on the overall added value of such an approach above and beyond purely the environmental arguments. Um, so we really need to make the case, the business case, uh, for, for those uh, materials and we need to um, help uh, reshape the business models, uh, for example, construction companies to see themselves as waste treatment and waste use companies next to being material focused companies. And uh, there were a couple of examples about that and I encourage you to read the summary <laughs> of the sessions uh, to get access to, to those. I want to highlight the huge opportunity for local jobs that is coming with that. All this is relatively labor intense and it brings jobs more locally uh, as well because of the well, then the reuse and the recycling of, of materials and the, the possible possibilities to look at uh, the regrowing materials uh, in a more local context. Um, despite these benefits, the World Building Council, um, no, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development estimates our world is only 9% circular and we're not going in the right direction yet. Um, so we really, really need to take some action here. And that's where the enablers are uh, so important. Um, and uh, we, again, we had some examples here, but I really want to, to highlight and focus that this is a newer area. Uh, it's the new kid on the block in a sense. It was nice to see that in this last session that we just had, there was a lot of focus already on embodied carbon. Um, and it's a huge potential area for market transformation, um, for more shorter supply chains. And uh, what, what we really still need to do is to build these markets. We need to build confidence in those new business models, the new products as well, and to make them uh, desirable. There's a huge opportunity to link to other sectors such as uh, agriculture, but also industrial development. Um, and to uh, emphasize the, uh, the, the, the redesign of buildings uh, to design them as material banks. Um, so I would leave it at that. 
And since you heard Marion um, on session three, I really want to be very, very brief on, on this. Um, it's very fresh in our minds, um, but it was very clear that we highlighted the need for scaling up. Uh, there is no excuse. We have the technologies, we have the solutions, we know uh, what needs to be done, but uh, the crux is in these enablers. Uh, we need to help overcome the fragmentation of the sector and spur radical collaboration of all players across the value chain. And this is where these roadmaps come in very handy and can help, um, not only by providing a framework, but also by providing a process that gathers all the stakeholders around the table um, to develop those targets and work backwards from those targets uh, in defining the milestones, both in terms of policy, technology and, uh, and finance angles. Um, I think what was very interesting uh, as well was this huge emphasis on building codes that I want to highlight, building codes and standards, um, because we need this confidence in the regulatory reform and we need larger policy packages so that we really see the financial instruments falling into place alongside uh, the, the, the codes. Um, the need for integrated planning. Um, I wanted to highlight the certification issue with this really important link between environment and quality insurance that will be such an important additional factor in going forward. Um, and I'm not doing justice to the richness of uh, the discussion around certification, but I think it's uh, it's really something to, to keep in mind. Uh, we had a really good example on how to take the roadmaps from the regional to uh, the national level, what it takes, some of the challenges that come with that. Um, uh, and that include, uh, well, sometimes the lack of data that we still need to address, uh, but also um, to break down those silos, not only across the different um, private sector players, but also the silos within the government and to work across ministries. And we all know that's not always easy, but it's really critical to, uh, to, to get to the level where we need to be in terms of setting the targets and to help with the implementation. Um, and I think I'll leave it uh, at, at that. There was one question that we didn't get to um, in, in, the, in the last round and was, having said all that about the opportunities and so on, how hopeful are we um, that governments will pick up on this uh, in the recovery packages, the COVID-19 recovery packages. And um, I, I just want to close with that. Uh, so a hopeful word um, that I'm, I'm very hopeful because um, it's a huge opportunity. The numbers are all there. We know that we've seen it, uh, for example, as a reaction to the last finance uh, financial crisis. Um, uh, there's huge cost savings overall. Um, there is huge potential for job creation. I started off my 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 intervention um, uh, of the session with this nine to to thirty uh, jobs per, per 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 million invested. That's much bigger than um, other sectors, uh, many other sectors. Uh, so there is a huge huge opportunity, and we've been reminded how important our homes are and uh, how big this housing crisis is as well. And um, so that that all the all the criteria are reunited to actually make this sector a key pillar of the eco economic recovery. Um, so I'm hopeful, and we have seen a number of countries already taking steps. And for example, um, the European Green Deal with the um, a, a real call for a renovation wave uh, is is on its way. So with that, I'd like to stop, and I would like to hand over for the closing remarks to our two distinguished speakers. Uh, first, Ove Sarmad, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Martina. Uh, just before I start, I want to make sure that the connection is working well and you can hear me OK. If you can just say OK, then I can go ahead. Works well. Great. Well, listen, thank you very much again uh, for this opportunity to share some uh, closing remarks at this very important session that you all had uh, from UNFCCC Climate Change Secretariat. Uh, all of us, we really hope and wish and uh, uh, expect that all of you are keeping safe uh, and managing these very, very unprecedented times. So our best wishes for good health and safety as we go through this and hopefully get out of it uh, stronger and more resilient. So once again, thank you. And I'd like to thank the Global ABC for the excellent support in organizing this technical experts meeting 
on mitigation this year. Uh, th this brings uh, tremendous uh, energy and valuable experience from experts from all around the world uh, in specific thematic areas. And this meeting is about building uh, and all that relates to it. And what we like very much about such discussions and meetings are these are not just for the sake of taking another box uh, of a meeting or a constituent body uh, carrying out the work which is being mandated, but actually to help develop actionable policies and action plans. So it's extremely important and we value it very much and we uh, look forward to working very, very closely with you. The objective of this year's STEM is to share solutions for the low emission housing and building and to continue to build a community for an ambitious vision of the sector zero carbon buildings by 2050. I'm very pleased to know that throughout the three sessions of the global TEM and four regional TEMs, uh, many of you have demonstrated and highlighted specific solutions to reduce emissions in the building sector. For example, in order to meet the growing cooling demand with minimum em emissions, Passive building design, building materials for low carb, low income community and green urban planning were highlighted. The circular economy concept, which is growing in importance and recognition, illustrated the pathway and the business case to reduce carbon footprint throughout the value chain from design, construction to disposal of buildings. Developing regional and national road roadmaps, as you just me mentioned, Martin, Martin, sorry will be useful uh, and very useful in terms of the tools they provide to facilitate engagement with, with relevant stakeholders towards ambitious building standards and the nationally determined contributions. We will need all solutions in order to achieve the zero carbon buildings by 2050. The building sector, as we know, as we've heard, plays a critical role in meeting the Paris Agreement, uh, goal of the Paris Agreement. We need to reach zero emissions by mid-century. It is just 30 years away and the buildings built today will remain for 30 years or even longer. So therefore we need to act now and we must remember that the world's population is expected to grow over the coming decades. In order to meet the demand for growing population, much more buildings will, need be, will be needed. Housing, schools, hospitals, commercial and leisure spaces and much more. Over the last decade, increasing in floor space has outpaced the improvement of energy efficiency and increase of renewable energies. We cannot afford to continue the way we design, build and use buildings. On the ground actions discussed during the TEM need to be scaled up and scaled up immediately. While COVID-19 pandemic has unfortunately posed serious challenges to all of us, the urgency of addressing climate change has not gone away. In fact, climate change magnifies many of the global challenges which other sustainable development goals seek to address and which the pandemic has highlighted. Poverty, access to healthcare, education, and adequate sanitation, safe and affordable housing, just to name a few. As governments around the world take actions to address and hopefully soon recover from the COVID-19 crisis, it is crit critical that our efforts to build back better, to redesign our economies and societies to become more sustainable, resilient and inclusive. We need to advance actions on climate change while improving human well-being. Under the UNFCC, uh, you know very well, our work continues to uh, uh, carry on. We are making every effort to keep the engagement and momentum as high as possible although through virtual uh, settings, and this is becoming almost a norm these days now. This year's virtual format made it possible for stakeholders around the world to participate in the TEM. Many of them would not have been able to attend if the meetings had taken place in Bonn, just as in previous years. Your participation to TEM adds great value to increase awareness and build the momentum for zero carbon building by 2050. The outcomes of the regional and global TEM will be captured in meeting reports 
And our secretariat will also publish a technical paper which summarizes best practices and reflects dis discussions at 10. Both papers will feed into the annual summary to policymakers, a document that will be pre prepared for COP26 next year. I believe this event and documents produced afterwards will inspire policymakers to implement the necessary policies so that actions taken to minimize emissions are accelerated at a pace and scale needed to achieve the goal of Paris Agreement. With the outcome of TEM, our Secretariat aims to better support implementation of the NDCs and long-term low emission development strategies through our regional collaboration centers that are located in different parts of the world and through more targeted and intensive policymaker engagement. I really hope that you all have been inspired by the various panelists, experts, the chair of the session and others who have taken active interest and part in these discussions. Our team at the UNFCCC certainly have been and are committed to working with all stakeholders to upscale the efforts to ensure the rapid take up of the solutions identified. Lastly, on behalf of the whole Secretariat of the UNFCCC, I'd like to express my deep appreciation to all who have participated, <clears throat> the speakers, the panelists, and participants for taking time out of your duties to participate in the TEM today. And I really, as I said at the right beginning, wish you all good health and safety through these uh, difficult times and all the success in your work on climate actions. We need that. Thank you very much and over to you, Martina. Thank you so Thank you. much um, for your words. Someone who is speaking at the same time. Um, and for highlighting the urgency of, of action, I think we cannot uh, emphasize that uh, enough uh, and as well making the link to the UNFCCC uh, process uh, and we were very, very um, happy to, uh, to cooperate with you and look forward to do that uh, going forward. And that takes us to the, to the race to zero because that's as well a way how to um, how to address the urgency uh, of the, the issues and it's another great uh, cooperation and with that uh, uh, I'd like to hand over to Gonzalo. Thanks, thanks so much Martina. I'm also expecting that uh, the, the connection will work properly. Um, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, but uh, most of you Martina Vice, thank you. Uh, dear colleagues and participants of the TEM, um, it's really great to be with you. I'm I'm really pleased uh, to be part of this closing uh, part of, of the event. Since TEM is is very, I would say, close to my heart. Not only because uh, our of our mandate to better integrate this work with the Marrakesh Partnership for Global Climate Action, but also because I believe it makes so much sense. Uh, it definitely makes sense to have these real deep dive discussions among policymakers and, and experts on practical solutions to all of those concrete pressing issues on the ground. But uh, I need to refer also very specifically, coming from the circular economy, private sector of Chile, I found this year topics of TEMEM particularly exciting. So thank you for that. I, I have indeed today and yesterday been uh, preparing my participation at Daring Cities uh, with my conversation with a uh, with, with my dear friend and fellow high level champion from the UK, Nigel Topping, we have been even discussing about different implementation of circular economy in cities like water, uh, waste, uh, nature based solutions, mobility, and of course, the whole built environment. So many things that you mentioned, Martina. Uh, I've been having deep dive conversations with Nigel and other people just uh, the last 24 hours. And, and as some of you may be aware, with, with Nigel, we lead the work on the Marrakesh Partnership and uh, it supports the parties in the implementation of the Paris Agreement by mostly catalyzing collaboration between governments and cities, regions, businesses, investors, civil society for them to immediately lower emissions and increase resilience against climate impacts. In this endeavor, uh, Global ABC is one of the co-focal points of the Human Settlement Thematic Group. So thank you, Martina, and your team for all your leadership in this work as well. 
So TEMS, as I said, are very important tools that also bring together policymakers at all levels of governments and experts. And in this year, we're seeing how much of that is so critical. Uh, you summarized, Martina, so well the outcomes of these three past sessions, and I'm inspired and encouraged that the discussions of low emissions housing and zero carbon building by 2050 are gaining momentum as these are needed for the systemic change and speak so well uh, towards the idea of building back better. Uh, the reason we must really focus on the built environment is because it has great inertia due to its complexity and fragmented value chain. Uh, therefore, radical collaboration across all stakeholders at the project and sector scale is needed to find solutions that will transform it. The real good news is, as Oveis uh, also mentioned, that the building and construction sector has a wealth of potential and options for circular economy and innovation. We're seeing that in so many regions and countries. I am therefore particularly happy that many good insights were shared about the circular innovative approaches and not just applying them to the construction of the buildings or construction materials, but also happy uh, them to operations such as how to manage the building that led to the reduction of capital and operational costs or using locally adapted materials, including agro waste, as you mentioned, uh, Martina, or how to concretely incentivize circular enterprises through effective policy and legal framework. The circularity is absolutely key to green recovery, not only because of the long investment time horizon of the sector, but because approximately 50% of buildings standing in 2060 are not yet built and because of its potential in creating green jobs. We heard 70-10% of global employment is related to building and construction, providing 9 to 30 jobs for every 1 million euros invested in green re renovation. But again, mostly because the COVID pandemic has made us realize even more accurately that buildings are homes for people, place, to work, place to study, place to rest, place to heal, place to connect uh, with people online as we are connected now. So the idea of having cities in which you can work, live, play, uh, do everything, hopefully in a 15 minute uh, distance as as, um, as Paris is, is, is uh, uh, projecting, uh, is, it, it makes so much sense, uh, mostly in this uh, COVID times that has shown that we can and we should many times transport less, but transport less for increasing the well-being of people and the well-being of the environment. And for many developing countries, we also need to change our notion of trade-offs between green cover and grey cover because we can achieve both and we need to uh, achieve both. We need to address also cooling as an emerging challenge, as, uh, as you said, as we can achieve green, urban sustainable development in thriving cities with passive design and natural cooling solution. For that, we heard that we need to increase scale and pace in this race to zero together. This is fundamental for the systemic change we're aiming for in the building environment. The radical collaboration is something we, as high-level champions, will keep promoting together with the Marrakesh Partnership stakeholders. Our climate action pathways are one of the tools that we believe will help accelerate it, along with Global ABC's regional uh, roadmaps. And of course, at the end, parties must increase ambitions. We, uh, as non-party stakeholders, are here to support the, the role of everything that we do must be on the serve of the ambition loops. Uh, we collectively build confidence of parties in increasing the ambition in the NDCs to refer to concrete policymakers uh, measures for buildings and to cover construction sector and embodied carbon sector such as steel and cement. So let's take that into consideration. Hopefully all of our work must be therefore projected in the enhancement of the NDC. That's something that we have to work on. I am therefore very inspired and would like to join Ovais in thanking all the speakers of all the three sessions for sharing us their critical insight and solutions. And last but not least, thank you also Global ABC and the UNFCCC Secretariat for organizing the TEMS. Thank you very much. Look forward to continue collaborating and hope to see you soon. Thank see you soon, so Gonzalo. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for these inspiring words on your leadership and we're looking forward to waking up the sleeping giant together. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.